Hello and welcome to the i3 podcast. My name is Wouter Klein and I'm the Director of Content for the Investment Innovation Institute. For more information about our educational forums for institutional investors, please visit our website at www.i3-invest.com. There you can also subscribe to our complimentary newsletter, i3 Insights in which we discuss investment strategy and asset allocation questions with asset owners around the world. Now, as you all know, we love our disclaimers in this industry, so here's ours. This recording is for educational purposes only. It does not constitute financial advice. Please enjoy the show. I'm here with Tim Hutchison from the Thinking Ahead Institute. Tim, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Vota. So for listeners that don't know what the Thinking Ahead Institute is, can you tell us a little bit about why it was established and what its aim is? Right. So uh, it kind of grew out of the Thinking Ahead group, uh, which was, uh, I guess, an R&D research team within Willis Towers Watson's investment business. Um, and it kind of grew out of concern of mine that the industry that I'd been very proud to join had kind of morphed from a profession to a business. At the same time, you could see that defined benefit pension funds were dying and being replaced by defined contributions. So the combination of investment risk being put onto individuals ill-equipped to shoulder it uh, with uh, kind of a morphing from a profession to a business. I kind of didn't like where that story might go. So uh, the idea was to kind of propose to the industry that uh, we needed to change ourselves to provide a better value to the end saver. And so the Institute uh, came about as a, as a kind of network of organisations, both asset owners and asset managers, who kind of shared that view of the world and wanted to work towards change. Yeah, yeah. And as part of um, uh, looking at the pension funds as organisations, um, you also look at the investing and the ecosystem of investment managers, fund managers. But I thought I'd start with a question about the investment markets and the structure of listed markets today. And the Institute likes to think about big questions. So I thought we start out with a nice big question. Are capital markets still functioning for their primary focus? And and sort of to give a bit of a background to that question, uh, which relates to some of the comments as well made by by John Kay uh, in the inquiry, where he basically wonders whether the element of capital formation, especially for smaller, mid-sized companies, is still the primary focus of listed markets. And I think the criticism there is that a lot of the trading is done by high frequency, by quant strategies. Um, I've read a statistic that 95% in the US market is quant strategy trading every day. Is the market still functioning as it should be for pension funds to be able to invest properly for their members? Wow, you have started big. Um, So we like John Kay. Uh, John Kay has spoken at a couple of our events uh, in the UK. Um, he's written some great books. I mean, other people's money is kind of fairly obvious on this subject. Uh, but if I'm allowed a small digression, I think his best book is called Obliquity. I think it came out in 2012. Um, I love that book. Anyway, so yes, our thinking would be very much in line with his. You could argue that the capital markets haven't served their original function for a very long time. So originally there was a heavy demand for capital uh, by capital-intensive industries, um, canals, uh, railroads, uh, chemical companies, you know, whatever, very capital-intensive, and the money was owned by rich individuals. So you needed a mechanism to kind of raise money for one entity from a large number of rich individuals. And the market was a great way to do the capital raising. 
these days, um, money is concentrated in much fewer hands. <clears throat> if you want to, uh, if, if there is a project that is capital intensive, and it tends to be, I guess, infrastructure or putting up a building, and you want to raise a billion, you can probably do that in about five phone calls mm -hmm. to some of these big pools of capital. So the structure on both sides has changed massively. There's also an argument that actually most businesses being set up these days are capital light. I, it's more about intellectual property intangibles, and they don't physically need lots of capital. And therefore, I would say for quite a while now, the stock market has been used as a cash-out mechanism, mm -hmm. i.e. the money is flowing the wrong way. Uh, the business has already been built privately, and this is an exit mechanism uh, for uh, a billionaire. Take uh, the US and the UK, the number of listed equities has been shrinking. In the UK, particularly on the AIM market, the alternative uh, investment market, very small companies. Uh, the US main market, you know, the joke is the Wilshire 5000 now has 3,500 stocks in or 3,400 or whatever the number is right now. And so the number of listed equities is shrinking. Uh, we've hit the era of net buybacks. And so for all of those reasons, no, the market is not functioning how it originally did, which was as a mechanism for raising capital. It doesn't do that anymore. So I have a personal hobby horse uh, which is the investment industry claims to allocate capital. It doesn't because capital in the vast majority of instances isn't being raised. Yeah. And so should pension funds be worried about this or uh, is not something they can change? How, how do you look at that? Yeah, there are a number of ways to answer that question. And you could think about it over a number of time horizons. Effectively, the logic of the first question you asked and my answer to it essentially says that pension funds these days aren't doing much investment. We call it investment, but if you go back to Keynes and his chapter 12 of his 1936 book, General Investment, which is putting money, risking money by building something new, and speculation, which is effectively buying a share in something that already exists. So in Keynes's terminology, Pension funds are speculating. If you're being slightly kinder, they're buying securities that are already an issue, so they're, they're kind of collecting rents mm -hmm. off money that was previously risked, invested. So the real worry for pension funds is where GDP goes from here, whether those securities that they currently own continue to pay a rent of some form, so apologies for the lack of simple answer. <laughs> Fair enough. But um, I suppose it's it's a big, large structural issue and, and not any single pension fund is going to change that necessarily. No. Can I maybe jump in with another thought? So one of the projects we'd like to work on next year in 2019, we're loosely calling Asset Classes of Tomorrow. Uh, so 2017, we wrote the Asset Owners of Tomorrow. This year, we're putting to bed asset manager of tomorrow and so we seem to have a franchise going so why not asset classes of tomorrow so take the thoughts that we've already discussed the shrinking number of listed equities and combine that with distributed ledger technology blockchain in common parlance well there is a record of fractional ownership so could it be that in five years time stock markets have become redundant actually we're tracing fractional ownership rights and transactions via the distributed ledger. And do we need this distinction between public and private? And it, then we go back to the fundamental idea, there's an enterprise. If it's raising capital, am I willing to risk that capital? And if it's somebody else has already risked their capital, do I want to kind of buy in and own that security and collect rents from its activities? Right, so we might see blockchain coming into the uh, the pension industry in that sense, in, in an investment sense. Um, I think I'd be surprised if it didn't. Right, right. Interesting. So you mentioned uh, one of the papers uh, that I would like to discuss, the asset owner of tomorrow. And uh, we, we started off with talking about investments, but you also make the point there that 
probably pension funds should be less focused on just achieving a return and more about uh, professional achievements and professionalism in, in, in the industry. And I was thinking of that and, and thinking of earlier developments in, in Australia with the regulator having had to define what pension funds are for. And that pretty much brought it back to, well, it's about generating wealth for the end beneficiary, which is a very financial return-focused objective. Focus more on the organizational side of things. Yeah. So it's kind of easy to describe investment as being a kind of two-dimensional problem of solving for risk and return. We would argue that it has always been and will increasingly be seen to be a three-dimensional problem, risk, return, and impact with a small i. So I'm not talking about social housing necessarily. I'm just talking about, let's say we are allocating capital, we decide to fund a business model, that business model has an impact on the world. It could put plastic in the ocean, it could put carbon in the atmosphere, it Whatever it happens to be, you cannot escape the fact that there is this kind of extra dimension. So risk, return and impact. What the debate is then is how do you define fiduciary duty? And what I hear in the marketplace is that people have interpreted fiduciary duty to attach a zero weight to this third dimension. So that's why... We're kind of used to thinking of it as a two-dimensional problem. So what we're trying to do through our papers, such as the Asset Owners of Tomorrow or, or, or other papers, is question whether a zero weight on this kind of impact dimension is compatible with fiduciary duty. So particularly relevant in Australia, which is dominated by defined contribution, you know, a 25-year-old now has, you know, 40-year accumulation period and a 20, 25-year decumulation. So you're talking six to seven decades. So then you've got to answer the intellectual problem. Am I really going to claim that maximizing a 12-month risk-adjusted return and then repeating that exercise 70 times is going to deliver what that individual needs versus sitting down now and kind of going, there is this kind of impact dimension. Does that, by ignoring it, do I store up future financial risk within a 60, 70 year window? Or actually, you can kind of approach the problem from another dimension whereby a kind of universal owner mentality would be the returns we need can only come from a system that works and the pensions we pay are worth more in a world worth living in. So either route that you take we are asking people to really consider whether they truly believe that a zero weight on this kind of impact dimension is consistent with long-term fiduciary duty. To a degree, when I, I, I listen to you explaining that, it, it makes sense, but also I get the idea, is this a way of bringing in a long-term perspective? Um, the Institute has written a couple of times about investing in, in the long term, but this impact element that you described, to a degree, seems to have a much longer horizon than the other two factors. Yes, so the, the kind of classic economic jargon would be the term externalities. So the debate or the question you've just asked me is we effectively take credit for the return in the current period, but any associated externalities almost by definition vest in a future period. So one of the research streams we've been running this year has been on value creation and we're just kind of putting to bed a big paper on that. And it's we've had a working group running, and it's been a really quite, well, for me personally, a deeply satisfying co-discovery process with the working group. And we're now quite clear what we think value creation is and isn't. 
And the working group are being quite tough in this paper, and they're basically asking the investment or, or saying that, in their opinion, and my opinion as well, the investment industry has a duty to take into account impacts on society and the planet whenever it's allocating new capital or when it's stewarding existing capital. And that's, I think, quite a radical position, but that's, that's where the working group has got to in its thinking about value creation. And value creation is both monetary there are some things that, are, that we know are intrinsically valuable, like health or family relationships or whatever. You know, would you sell your child because somebody, you know, bid the right price? Well, what a ridiculous concept. Mm. So we have to accept that value has a non-monetary component. And therefore, you can also think about providing wealth and well-being. It doesn't all dumb down to a dollar amount. Yeah. And still, when you talk to asset owners, you ask them, what is the long term in, in practical sense? And often, the, often it comes back, well, if we look at our investments, we will never hold anything that loses money for five years. And probably after three years, it's out. So from an investment perspective, even though pension funds should be ideally placed to take a long term perspective in, in sort of a DC world, it's three years. Uh, yes, um, and you've been kind enough to note that we have written in the past on long horizon investing and one of the papers that we wrote was uh, quantifying the long term premium. So the only way that there can be a long term premium to harvest is if people effectively refuse to harvest that long term premium by being long term investors. So it, there's a kind of circularity to that argument. Nobody is going to be comfortable about losing money for five years. But what do they mean by losing money for five years? If that is the plan that you sign up to, i.e. somebody is going to draw down your capital to build a business, so you are investing slugs of money each year for five years, that's one thing. If all that they're talking about is having a mark-to-market valuation hit, but they're not putting new money in, then I think those those are different things. But the one thing that we learned very clearly through our work on long-term investing is until you get those periods of negative performance, you can't tell the short-term investors from the long-term investors. So it's only when you have those poor periods of poor performance, you observe the behavior. So anybody capitulating and selling out is declaring themselves to be a short-term investor, and therefore they're not collecting any long-term premium. So they're basically just missing out? Essentially, yes. But then that that's why the long-term premium exists, yeah. because it it's act. And sorry to mention Keynes again, but it, but kind of I bang on about everybody in the investment industry should read chapter 12 of, of the general theory. And by the way, it's out of copyright now, so you can get it free on the internet. No excuse for not reading it. It's only one chapter. And, and he, he, he perfectly describes how hard it is to invest long term. Yeah. In that recent paper that we uh, discussed earlier, um, you also make the case for having multiple horizons, multiple time horizons. Can you explain a bit how that might work? This, uh, the case that you put to me previously about we couldn't hold this position if it was a losing position for five years. Well, surely you've just scaled your position wrong. Surely there is some weighting that you could put on. If it, if it conditional on the expected return being attractive and you want to own it, then if you get your weighting right you should be able to hold that for the long term. This is your benchmark, you only perform it for three years, you know. Uh, then that particular setup doesn't have multiple time horizons operating at once, does it? No. So um, what I think about multiple time horizons operating at, at once is you will have 
some elements of your portfolio that are satisfying short-term liquidity needs or whatever, or might be somewhat more tactical, you know, or they could actually be, you know, a maturing investment that you made 15 years ago. It's kind of like, do you know what? There's nothing left to go for here. But essentially, you wouldn't stake all of your portfolio now on a 10-year outcome. I think it comes back to different elements in, in investing and also between different asset classes. Essentially, it is a theme that I hear come back more every time you speak with asset owners that, yes, we should think about this on the long term, and it seems to apply to strategy and asset allocation, but then how they fill it in, it rarely goes beyond the three-year time horizon. Um, so you could probably say that uh, asset allocation, a strategic asset allocation is, is a longer term horizon, but how that's filled in is probably not much more beyond that time frame. Yeah, so uh, so one of the things that we're going to be thinking about and hopefully writing on next year will be total portfolio approach, which effectively sets itself up in competition against strategic asset allocation. And there, there I can see that there are some interesting potential problems. Um, so most asset owners have an executive reporting to a governing board. Um, and the governing board probably feels ownership of a strategic asset allocation. If you move to a total portfolio approach, or TPA, then effectively the board need to cede control to the executive. And instead of setting the strategic asset allocation and ranges that the executive can vary within, it's, it's just handing over a long-term goal and a risk budget. Under that new framing, once, once you have a total portfolio mentality, the executive could kind of go, do you know what? This opportunity can go into the portfolio because it contributes in the following ways and it might contribute over a particular time frame. So one of my one of my particular frames of thinking about assets is fundamentally what different types of assets can you diversify between and I can get to about three. There are real assets, contractual cash flows and contingent cash flows. So that sounds a bit abstract. An equity a listed equity will typically be a long position in a real asset. The corporation probably has some plant or machinery. It's probably a short position in contractual cash flows because the corporation has also issued corporate debt. So it has to pay those out. And then it's a long position in contingent cash flows, i.e. you own the residual. So contingent on the company being successful, contingent on the company increasing sales, then you get a payoff to, to that asset class. So if you think about contingent cash flows, then diversification becomes a game of diversifying across contingencies. And the problem in many cases is most people are quite undiversified on contingencies. It all tends to be related to economic growth and that's where your multiple time horizons can also come in because if you can have certain certain contingencies occurring at different points in the future then you have a bit of time diversification as mm -hmm. well yeah it's interesting that you say that because some of the asset owners we spoke to that um, have a total portfolio approach um, and we spoke to them about hedge funds they said well the hedge fund portfolio that we're building is completely different than it would be as a standalone hedge fund portfolio. As, as part of the broader portfolio, it plays a specific role and it has different allocations. Does that come across, um, uh, is that sort of in line with your idea about these contingencies and diversification across that? Well, yeah, I mean, it's perfectly consistent with that. And, and also I would say that's the theoretically correct answer. So I'm glad that that's the answer they're giving to you. So it's not about building a standalone hedge fund fund portfolio it's what's this manager's strategy and how does that relate to the rest of the portfolio components actually it doesn't add that much okay so not that one 
but a different one would improve the overall portfolio. And, and when you look at that total portfolio approach, um, we hear today a lot about factory investing. Um, that does seem to be a bit more easy to imp- implement if you have a total portfolio approach rather than just standalone investment options. I don't know that I would necessarily agree that it's easier. To me, if you had a strategic allocation with X percent allocated to equities, then you could do all of that uh, on a factor basis. So I'm not saying it's any more difficult, but I'm not sure it's easier. (laughs) Okay, fair enough. Um, If we go back to the paper, uh, there are a number of um, items that you think should be addressed for uh, the future and, and preparing for the future. You also mentioned that, that, that culture is something that asset owners do particularly well and that they can improve on. Uh, what are they not doing well? So culture is a particular passion of ours. So if I kind of, if you'll forgive me and allow me to backtrack slightly. The Thinking Ahead Institute is effectively trying to bring change to the investment industry. And we think it's necessary to do that in three different respects. Number one, better investment strategies. That's kind of obvious. Number two, better organisational effectiveness. And number three, better societal legitimacy, where if you consider that as a Venn diagram, the absolute high impact stuff is the overlap of those three areas. So culture, I would argue, lies in the intersection between better organisational effectiveness and better societal legitimacy but probably more in organisational effectiveness. So a culture will enable you potentially to do your investment strategies better. It can become a differentiator that can't be copied. It can help you with retention. It can help you with hiring of new talent. And so for us, there's a whole host of reasons why you would work on your culture. Most people probably come from the position of, culture is what it is and can't be managed that's kind of not our position you know you can invoke uh, the mantra that's attributed to Peter Drucker what gets measured gets managed so if you want to manage culture then you have to have an attempt at measuring it and so in the institute we've developed a score uh, a um, an assessment tool to score two aspects of culture that we think are measurable the employee value proposition and the customer value proposition. We're just starting there and measuring it gives you insights. Uh, And we'd also assert that that any culture that is unmanaged will kind of regress. So it might currently be a good or strong culture, but it will dilute itself and kind of regress to some sort of average uh, if left unmanaged. So from that general statement, I would say that maybe asset owners haven't been as studious in deliberately seeking to manage their culture. I think they have some cultural advantages, like they're in many cases they're closer to the beneficiary or the end saver, and that can uh, be an advantage in a cultural context of uh, instilling a sense of purpose. And related to that, um, we spoke a little bit about this in the past as well, but the um, nece- necessity for cognitive diversity, um, that it's, it's, it's quite dangerous to create this group of like-minded people because, yes, you can maybe get things done more effectively and quickly, but you also don't always ask the right questions about what can go wrong. Um, do you see any meaningful headway, headway being made uh, in this area? Oh, I'd love to give you a positive answer. But, <laughs> uh, the truthful answer is that changes in that respect are going to be slow realistically. So in a slightly naughtier or confrontational moment, I would trot out that uh, you know we hire people from a very small number of universities uh, who've done the same degrees we then put them through the same training programs the same cfa syllabus we sit them in front of the same bloomberg terminals and give them the same valuation models you know what what do we expect at the end of the day you know to kind of change that to to kind of value and incorporate the views of a medieval historian is is going to be tricky 
But the one positive that I will that I will commit to is the conversation is now much more in play. As in there is now much more willingness to have that conversation. And I'd say we've almost won the first round of the argument. So that's a kind of like precursor to change, but I don't I don't think we've changed yet. Yeah. Is is it also a matter of finding r- the the right implementation of it? Because um, we sort of think about well, we just we need to hire people with different backgrounds or different uh, degrees or different ways of thinking, um, or is it more having uh, a, a different type of panel, like an investment committee, that you can measure ideas against, but don't necessarily have to be part of every single decision in day to day operation? Or do we need to hire people at all? In what sense? Well. Surely the robots are coming, and well, we're well, soon they probably don't and think any different than what you program them to. Uh, yeah, so actually, the diversity that we want are, are data scientists and coders for our robot-built portfolios. But that's only a part of the industry, isn't it? Um, you're probably right, but if but if we're having a conversation, then you know how many people drive a hand-built car? Yeah, you know, know. You, you you can drive you can buy a hand-built car they're just incredibly expensive so when it comes to cars we're all happy to drive robot built cars and maybe we won't we won't even own and drive cars shortly so the idea that portfolios will still be built by hand is an interesting one i think there will be hand-built portfolios um but but what we're arguing about is is the size yeah I was also thinking of, because earlier you said that there is that third dimension to investing. It's not just about risk and return. And a lot of the people that you describe that are sort of this similar within each organization are the people that worry about risk and return and probably not so much about the impact side of things. So potentially that's somewhere where you can get people with different viewpoints and different perspectives on, on issues that in the end, relate back to investment. Um, I I agree with you, um, but just imagine how hard that's going to be to integrate when people are kind of asking your core team who are thinking in risk return space to kind of go, no, that security is no good because look at its impact dimension. You know, that will be a real integration of diverse opinion problems. (laughs) Yeah. It, it, it just made me also think of uh, a conversation I had with a, a senior investor who's been in the industry for a long time, and he's more a quant himself. But he was actually lamenting the fact that all the new people that are hired are all quantitative people because he says, in the end, we need some bigger picture thinkers as well, and, and we don't get them in, the, in our organization anymore. And he comes from the perspective that he himself is a quant, so obviously he values that part of the process. Is is there a is there a danger that we are over quantifying all of the processes? Possibly yes. So, in if I kind of go back to my slightly provocative uh, portfolios will be built by robots. Then it is it's you. I use it slightly provocatively, but actually, what are we saying? If if we contend that there are multiple time horizons and we contend that there might be an impact dimension and actually when we're talking about an impact dimension we're conflating carbon footprint water footprint um you know a gazillion dimensions potentially then actually what are computers really really good at crunching a whole bunch of numbers very fast they have an inherent advantage over a human of being able to combine all of those multiple dimensions together very, very fast. But humans also have intrinsic advantages, exactly as you point out in your question, of seeing things differently, applying a different lens, having a bigger picture view of what's going on. And so uh, we talk about technology plus people or machine plus human not either or quite how that works out i'm not bright enough to kind of predict (laughs) 
you're probably heading towards the, th uh, the the area there of big data and alternative data sets where you have data that's not necessarily financial data that becomes increasingly more important for investing. Um, to what degree do you think that that will be a significant driver for, say, the next five years, or is that more a short-term hype? Yeah, I'm trying to think about how much I'm allowed to disclose. There is one investor that I know of uh, that I admire a lot who have basically exited long-only active equity management. Completely. Completely. Uh, and have barbelled between market capitalization index tracking factors and then kind of extreme hedge fund. And essentially the thinking is they've taken a forward-looking view on the world that you need to be spending a billion dollars a year on technology. Hardware, software, data, coders and quants, data scientists. If you're spending that much, then you are likely to have an edge and they, you know, they will be combing whatever data set, you know, satellite imagery, um, number of cars in a Walmart car park, you know, whatever it happens to be to make inferences and to trade in the market. And so essentially, that investor has said that is, in their opinion, the way the future is going. And the traditional long only active manager will just be sifting through the scraps that those other investors leave behind. So that is in line with the idea that we are in an arms race of, of getting bigger and better systems to deal with these new data sets that have come out and that the person that basically goes in big will be the winner. Ever seen an escalating arms race in this business before? <laughs> well, surely that that's the bidding up of salaries. You know, we need the best talent. I'd say this this industry is a classic arms race industry. Right, so instead of going for um, getting the, the brighter talents in, we're now getting the bigger systems in. Yeah, or, or the talent war has moved to data scientists and coders. Yeah, that could very well be. I have one final question for you, and that comes uh, as well uh, from the paper uh, that we discussed earlier. And you raised this question in the paper, and you partially answer it. And it says, the industry will have succeeded when the end saver knows how best they can compound their wealth through their lifetime and has the right products to be able to achieve that. And then you say, I wonder if we ever get there. How optimistic are you? Oh, I'm jet lagged. And <laughs> that has an impact on one's level of optimism. And if the truth be told... Uh, my optimism is not a static uh, variable. So some days I'm more hopeful than others. I referred earlier to I've personally uh, got a lot out of journeying with the working group as we've been looking at value creation. I think we've understood some pretty deep stuff that I have never understood before. That kind of thing gives me hope that with a deeper understanding you can come up with better solutions. Catch me on a different day, and I'm still probably wondering if if we've got time left to correct this thing. My thinking has got me to the place where if we define growth in GDP terms, then the only sustainable long-term rate of growth is 0% per annum. And that's kind of not how we've built our investment system. So... Depends on the day you catch me on as to how optimistic I am. Okay, well, I'll give you a call tomorrow, Donny, and then we take the mean from that answer. Tim, thank you very much for this podcast. It was a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you, Voter. Thank you for listening to the i3 podcast. For more information, please visit www.i3-invest.com. Thank you very much.